Thank you so much, Keith, for leading us in worship this morning. And I'd like to invite you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. And I'll invite Donna to come and read this morning's passage. Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46. Again, Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46. Reading from the ESV. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from the other as, shep as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed. By my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did you see when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did to me. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do to it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Thank you, Donna, for reading God's word for us this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these words you've given to us that speaks of eternity. And the choice that you've given to us as to which place we want to belong. And the way you provide for us to have an eternity in heaven. So Lord Jesus, we pray now as you, when we string these words, that you'd speak to us and draw us ever closer to you. Lord, open our eyes to see you. Open our ears to hear from you. And give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Which Richard Abaines wrote in a Christian magazine called Christianity Today. Back in 1994, he wrote these words in an article. 
the idea of hell and judgment are nowhere to be found. In 80s bestseller embraced by the light in the New York Times bestseller list for more than 40 weeks, included, including five weeks as number one. In November 1973, A.D. allegedly died after undergoing a hysterectomy and returned five hours later with the secrets of heaven revealed by Jesus. Ide says that Jesus never wanted to do or say anything that offended me while she visited heaven. Indeed, Jesus seems to be seems to be relegated to the role of the happy tour guide in heaven, not the savior of the world who died on the cross. Kind of a shocking statement, isn't it? As Richard Abaines quotes about this lady's experience of her experience of her visit to heaven, kind of shocking, isn't it? That is not at all the Jesus we understand from Scripture or the heaven that we understand from Scripture. There are a number of books out there these days of some people who have said that they died and went to heaven and then returned and told their stories. And frankly, I don't trust those stories because God's Word tells us that man is appointed to die. By the way, when we say man in God's Word, it means woman too, right? <laughs> Man is appointed to die once and then the judgment. Now, it's possible that maybe someone had a vision of heaven, but it would still be in line with Scripture. So if you ever hear those stories, then again, of, of someone who went to heaven and returned, no, they didn't. Um, that they maybe have a vision, sure, it's possible to have a vision, but no one has died and gone to heaven and returned other than Jesus. This morning, the subject that we're looking at is our next statement of faith, which is on heaven and hell. And uh, this day and age, we see that there's a lot of preachers who don't want to preach on hell. And, and for some good reason, I admit, hell is not a subject I like talking about. Most of us, probably all of us, don't like hearing about hell. But yet, it's a topic that the world needs to hear about and understand. They also need to understand and know about heaven. In our statement of faith, we see that this is also an important part of believing as Christians. So we believe rightly, so we can believe rightly about the gospel and about God as well. So we need to understand these things about heaven and hell. And again, admit... I admit, half of this sermon I don't want to preach because it makes me feel uncomfortable, but yet God's word must be preached rightly. So our statement of faith says this on heaven and hell. We believe that heaven and hell are real places, the former for those who are saved of their sins and the latter reserved for the unrighteous and demons. This topic is important for us. Last Sunday we talked about salvation and how to be saved and what we believe about salvation. This Sunday is and actually is in a way a continuation of that sermon as we look at heaven and hell. Again, we need to understand what God's word says about heaven and hell because without understanding what God's word says, we will have the wrong idea about these two places. And it may affect our eternity as well. The first thing we understand from our passage this morning and our statement of faith is this. Heaven and hell are real places. They are real places where when we pass on from this world or when Christ returns, whichever happens first, we will end up in one of these two places based on our understanding of, our, of the gospel and the reception of it or not. Now, the topics that are discussed the most in Scripture, they all converge with the gospel message. 
of the topics that Jesus personally spoke about all, again, converge with the gospel. Two of those gospel topics are the two that are discussed frequently by Jesus. Again, is heaven and hell. I remember hearing one preacher say at one time that the topic that Jesus talked about the most was money. No, he didn't. Jesus actually only talked about money two times. There's times he used money as, as an illustration in what he was teaching, but directly talking about money was only twice. Heaven and hell were talked about far more than any other topic that Jesus talked about. Many people out in our world, though, believe that these places are not real. But they are real places. We may not have archaeology to prove heaven and hell, but it's something that Jesus talked about as real places. We can prove places like Jericho. We know in the Old Testament, in the book of Joshua, how Israel marched around Jericho and how the walls fell down. And we actually have archaeological evidence of that. We don't have that for heaven and hell. But because we see the truth throughout God's word, we can see and believe that heaven and hell are real places. And heaven is described, and hell are described in scripture. Let's look, first of all, at how heaven is described. We even have it on the screen here. Heaven is described as having walls made of jasper. Not of our little friend Jasper here, but a certain kind of rock, an element called Jasper. It's a gem of beauty and of rarity, of great worth. Revelations 21 verse 16 says, The material of the wall was Jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. Imagine walls made of valuable stones like jasper. We think of that as being beautiful, right? And being awesome. And yet, think compare that to the building supplies we use today. Most of our homes are probably built out of wood, right? Two by four, maybe two by six studs, and maybe some insulation between the walls. Well, hopefully there's insulation because otherwise it'd be pretty cold in winter, right? Then on the outside, you'd have some plywood and some siding of some kind, probably inside drywall or some other kind of wall covering. Floors that were made of wood and then maybe you have carpet or maybe you have hardwood or, or laminate or maybe vinyl, tile. These are all different kind of building supplies that we have and, and sometimes they look really good, but imagine the walls of your home being made of jasper. That would seem pretty impressive and yet... For God to create heaven, the city of hell, the walls of heaven being jasper out of abundance. And heaven is also described as having foundation of precious stones. Revelation 21 verse 19 and 20 says, The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, I'm not even sure if I can say this right. Chalcedony. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, crystallite. The eighth, brill. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, Christopras, the eleventh, Jasonith, the twelfth, Amethyst. Those are a lot of precious stones, aren't there? This week, we, a couple days ago, we went to visit my mother, stepdad, and on the way, though, we were having some family picked a time out at, at a park, and but. The washrooms weren't available there, so we had to find a washroom. So we went to a mall not too far away from us, and we were walking down the mall, Sherry and, and Ariel and I, and 
we come across this one store that's walking by, and there's these big giant gems. And I think one of them was amethyst, wasn't it? And Sherry and Ariel actually talked a moment about the amethyst and how beautiful it looked. Imagine the foundations of the walls of heaven be made out of that. That's one of the gems that the walls were made out of. Next, heaven is described as having streets of gold. Revelations 21, 21 says, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a pearl. And the streets of the city was pure gold, transparent like glass. Imagine how see gold that pure that it's transparent. You could see through it. That's how the streets of heaven are made, of pure gold. Then the gates are made of pearls. And we just read about that again in Revelations 21, 21. Each gate was made of a single pearl. Pretty amazing. Have you ever seen a polished pearl? What's that? Not that big. <laughs> yeah. But again, that's another something of beauty that ha has rarity and, and something that's very costly. You know where pearls come from? Right, from oysters. So what happens is a little bit of grit gets into the oyster and it agitates the oyster and forms this pearl. But when it's made inside the oyster, it's a very rough, jagged looking thing. It's not as beautiful as when it's on jewelry. So when they're found, they're taken out and they're shaped and they're polished to be a thing of beauty. Not every oyster out there makes a pearl. Thank goodness, because those who like eating oysters, you don't want to have a pearl in your oyster, do you? <laughs> a thing of beauty. All 12 gates to heaven, or into heaven, we know there's one way to heaven, but there's 12 gates of he in heaven. But each one made of a pearl. It's got to be some big pearl, isn't it? Nextly, heaven is described as having no death. We kind of move now from the physical of what heaven looks like, but what also takes place in heaven, and this is one of the things, there is no death. Think about that. That's hard for us to comprehend, isn't it? No death in heaven. We know that at some point in our life, that our life is going to end. Um, I don't know when Christ has returned, there's two ways... Of same for God's judgment throne. It's either death or or him coming and call us home to heaven when he comes with his second coming. But probably for most of us, we probably won't be alive when Christ returns. We'll be as part of the the dead in Christ will rise, right? As God's word tells us. But we'll be in heaven, there's no death, ever. Revelation 21, verse 4, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. That's amazing, right? How could that be, no death in heaven? Because there's no sin in heaven. Because there's only life, eternal life. Next, heaven is described as having no mourning. Think of a difficult time you had, maybe a, a loss of a loved one, or maybe something tragic happened in your life, and and then you have a time of mourning. God's word actually tells us it's good to mourn. It's it's part grief is okay and is good. It's part of the healing process when we lose someone who's important to us. But in heaven there'll be no mourning. It makes sense because there's no death, right? There's nothing to mourn over in heaven because there's no death. Again, Revelation 21, verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying 
or pain, the first things have passed away. Which lends to this next part here too. The heaven is described as having no crying. Again, Revelation 21, verse 4, the very beginning part of it says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And later in that verse, there won't be any mourning or crying. Some was described to say that the only tears that will be in heaven are the tears of joy. There won't be tears of mourning. There won't be of sadness. There won't be of, of pain or suffering. So they won't be crying. It's possible to have tears while they're crying, right? Also, there'll be no pain in heaven. Again, Revelation 21, verse 4. Midway through the verse, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. Man, there's a few of us here who are looking forward to that, right? <laughs> I'm looking forward to have no more arthritis in my shoulders. Some of you are looking forward to the, the pains that you and ailments you have to be no longer because we're in heaven where there's no more pain. But not only physical pain, there won't be any emotional or mental pain anymore. No suffering of any kind in heaven. Sounds like a wonderful place, doesn't it? A utopia, right? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I want to go there. Now let's compare. God's word also talks about hell and what hell looks like and describes hell. Contrast is quite different. Hell is described as a place of judgment. Hebrews 6 verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not, not, laying, down, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Those last two words are speaking of hell. Eternal judgment. If there is one verse at all in scripture that clarifies that hell is eternal for those who choose not to receive gifts, God's gift of salvation, it's these two words here. There are some who believe that, oh, hell doesn't exist, or, or hell does exist, but, but no one goes there. You just cease to exist when you die if you don't have to receive the gift of salvation. Brothers and sisters, nothing could be further from the truth. And we see it in these two words here, eternal judgment. Scary thought, isn't it? The way it gets worse. Hell is also described as a place of fire. Kind of like a furnace. Have you ever stood or sat near your furnace when it's turned on? Maybe there's some issue that you're having with your furnace, so you kind of check out to see what's happening with it. And maybe you had the, the grate off to see when it fires up. You kind of feel the warmth when it fires up, when the grate's got not there, right? It feels warm and hot. You know because of seeing the heat there and they don't want to touch it. They actually say that the that of a flame, the hottest part is is, is the blue part of the flame. But actually, in reality, they've researched and found further that we take, for example, we look at a, at a candle. You kind of see the red and orangey, glowy part. Then you look closer, you see the blue. But then you see this part that's translucent between the flame and the wick. There's still flame in there. It's actually the hottest part of the flame. There's actually examples of fire out there that you can't see. Think of a bog. Have you ever heard of bog fires? They're fires that can actually go underground and then they pop up somewhere and then you see the flame. But underneath, you can't see the flame because it's a white, it's a translucent flame. Hell is like a furnace. Hot. Unending. 
where's the hottest place you've ever been? You don't have to answer that out loud. Just think for a moment for yourself. Where's the hottest place you've been? Maybe next to a fireplace or maybe you've gone to Arizona or or somewhere else. Maybe I remember going to Osoyas several summers ago on vacation and driving through there. We were so thankful for air conditioning because it gets hot in Osoyas. <laughs> I don't do very well with heat. As you can tell, because I'm a redhead, right? <laughs> Most redheads don't do well with heat. But think of the hottest place you've ever been and multiply it to the point of beyond what you could bear for heat. And I'll start to give you even a bit of a hint of the, of the fire of hell. Matthew 13, verse 41 and 42 says, the Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all the stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When Christ returns, those who have not received his gifts of salvation are going to be gathered by God's angels and cast into this furnace of fire. Jude 6 and 7 also to that effect. And angels who do not keep their own domain, but abandon their proper abode, he has kept an eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as those indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example of undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Did you catch, catch that first part? Basically, hell was it originally designed for demons. Those fallen angels who rebelled against God. That's what hell was intended for. It wasn't intended for us as humans. But nonetheless, God is using it as a place for punishment for those who don't receive his gift of salvation. Next, hell is described as utter darkness. Matthew 22, verse 13, The king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. Outer darkness. In that place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, take a moment to think about the darkest place you've ever been. Or even think, contemplate about space. You look out in space, there's a lot of darkness, isn't there? Other than these little twinkling stars. But even there, there's still light, right? I remember one night, we were at home. I was a teenager at home. And it was dark. The street lights were actually out. I was in the basement. And it was pitch black dark. Have you ever heard the phrase of so dark that you can feel the darkness? It was kind of like that. And hell is like that. It's so dark. You could wave your hand in front of your face and you wouldn't see it. It's that dark. So dark that you feel it. Some may say though, but that doesn't make sense. If, if hell is on fire, how, how could hell be dark then? Remember we talked about moments ago about fire being transparent? The hottest part of the flame? That's hell. Hell on fire. Flames that you can't feel, or sorry, that you do feel, but you can't see. And it's utter darkness. Also hell is described as a place of torment. Luke 16, 23 in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. This comes actually from the story of, of a man who was poor and a, and a beggar who begged from, his name was Lazarus, and he begged from a rich man, and the rich man didn't take care of Lazarus. And after Lazarus and this rich man died, Lazarus went to heaven, and the rich man went to hell, and the rich man asked, God, can you send Lazarus to, to come to me? And, and even, 
even dip his finger in some water and, and tip it on my tongue so I can have some relief. Because he was in torment. So hell is described as a place of torment. Next, hell is described as a place of weeping. Contrast to heaven, right? Heaven, of no, a place of no more weeping, no more sadness. Hell is a place of weeping, a place of eternal sadness and of pain and of suffering. So much so that they're weeping. Matthew 13, verse 41 and 42. The Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and throw them into the furnace of fire in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Imagine that, a place so awful that the entire time you're there crying. Maybe because it's fear, maybe because it's of, of the torment of the hells of fire. Maybe it's because of remembering all the awful things you've done and recognizing that you don't have any forgiveness. All the mental and emotional anguish happening in hell at the same time too. Which lends to the next parts too, and hell is described as a place of gnashing of teeth. We've just read that about that in Matthew thirteen, forty one to forty two again. At the end there it says there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a couple of different interpretations for this phrase here. One is that that the person is so angry at God that they're gnashing their teeth at God. Well, that could be because in the case of hell, man may feel anger. I don't know, maybe that's the case. But the second interpretation, which I think is probably the better one, is that, again, the person is in such pain and torment that they're gnashing their teeth. Have you ever been in a place where you've been in such pain that you're grinding your teeth? We've probably all seen a, a show, a movie, or a TV show where... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, it's tickling my throat. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> Imagine a picture of that in a movie or a TV show where they try to set someone's bone right again. Maybe their bone was broken. What do they do? They give some that person a bone or a twig or or something to put in their mouth to bite down on. Why do they do that? So they don't gnash and grind their teeth. Because of such pain they are in. I think that describes better what the gnashing of teeth in hell, in hell is like. Because the pain and suffering one is endearing. And it's not just for a season. It's for eternity as we said moments ago. Hearing about how heaven and hell are described, which do you want to go to? I don't know about you, but heaven is where I want to go. This is part of what we understand and believe about heaven and hell. But our statement of faith is another part to this. It's that heaven and hell have reservations. They have reservations. Again, God created heaven and hell for specific places of destination, depending on whether one is a saint or a sinner. Whether a person comes to faith in Jesus or rejects his salvation. I'm reminded of, a, of an old song by a Christian band called White Hearts. It's, I actually took a part of their course and made it as a ringtone because I there's two songs like that. Like the, I'd have to play it for you another time because I can't play it for you right now. But this one song is called Invitation by White Heart. And in the chorus, the singer is singing, he, set, he has sent me here to let me know You've got an invitation to paradise. I like when my phone rings and that tune comes up because I'm hoping people around are listening to there's an invitation for them to heaven. Um, I have another song similar to that, like I just mentioned a moment ago, that uses a ringtone for that purpose. That song describes, though, that we all have an invitation. 
an invitation to heaven. So how does one receive their invitation or respond to their invitation to heaven? Well, a person responds to their invitation to heaven the reserva- and by getting the reservation for heaven by being in Christ. John, 1 John 5.20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Interesting. This is the true God and eternal life. So that's how we res- how we get our reservation from the invitation from Christ. We have to be in Christ. We have had to have come to faith in Jesus Christ by confessing our sins to him and surrendering our lives to him. Trusting that he will do exactly what he said, save us from our sins when we confess it to him. That's what makes us a saint. That's how we receive, how we respond to the invitation for salvation. That's how we get our reservation in heaven. And a person's reservation is in heaven if they have eternal life. Again, that's part of what we just talked about. Having eternal life is coming to faith in Jesus Christ, surrendering our lives to him. 1 John 5, verse 11 and 12. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and his life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. This is how we receive our reservation, or shows that we have received our reservation for heaven. There's two more parts to that too. That we are citizens of heaven. Philippians 3.20 For our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. (coughs) When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are no longer citizens of earth We are what's called sojourners. We're foreigners. We're just passing through this world because heaven is our home. These last number of days, because of some of the stuff going on in politics and in our world, the term citizenship has come before me as as I've looked at one of the laws on a certain situation I was looking at in regards to our, our day. And it was interesting because it, was, it had to do with the Freedom of Information Act in our country. And it, it talks about you can ask any government authority in our country for documents or recordings of something that's taken place because it's supposed to be public record. And so when you request it, you're supposed to receive it. And in that it says if you're a citizen of Canada... Well, that's one of the wonderful things about being a citizen of Canada. You can request for those documents. (coughs) We also have other benefits for being Canadian citizens. We get to vote in our elections in Canada. There's certain laws that apply to us that gives us certain rights and freedoms in our country too that, that those who come to our country don't get because they're not citizens. So it's a wonderful thing to think of, right? Being a citizen of, of a country truly is a blessing to be a citizen of our country. But even better, because we're saints, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we're citizens of heaven. We have the benefit of all that awaits for us in heaven. Then also, reservation in heaven if they repent. We've talked about that a lot already this morning, haven't we? Again, Acts 3.19, Therefore, Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. We receive our reservation for heaven if these four things are true. The first one, the last point again, that we repent of our sins. 
then we are a citizen of heaven. We have eternal life then because we are in Christ. So now what is one's reservations for getting to hell? Simply this. You don't have to do anything to go to hell. And you for sure don't have to repent then. Luke 13 verse 3 says, I tell you no, that unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You know, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? I would dare say that hell is the lazy way. Not that we do anything to be saved, it's not at all, but what we do have to do is humble ourselves and repent. It takes humility. But hell, you don't have to do anything to go there. Just live your life absent of God, never repenting of your sin, just going about life your own way. Heaven and hell are real places that have reservations. The question is, is where do you have your reservation today? Are you taking the lazy way and not turning to God and repenting? Or do you want to be in heaven and have taken that step then in faith, repenting of your sin, and turning your life to Him? Heaven and hell are real places. They exist. We all are going to one of these two places. Either at the appointment of our death or when Christ returns. And heaven and hell have has reservations. Again, where is your reservation? <coughs> I want to, in closing, paint two pictures for you. So I invite you for a moment just to close your eyes and picture this. The first place is this. Imagine yourself in a place that is completely dark. But you feel unending heat. It's so hot that you would feel like the, the skin from your body would melt, and yet it's not, but you're, you're feeling it, the pain as if it were still happening. Then imagine this and seeing a screen before you of maybe scenes of your life, of, of all the evils that you've done, being reminded over and over of the wrongs you've done. But then also to feel greater pain emotionally and mentally. In a moment of, of recognizing of what's going on around you, you hear also other screams of other people, but you can't see anyone. You feel utterly alone helpless, afraid, ashamed, <clears throat> sheer terror, all at the same time. That's somewhat what hell is like. Now let's go to another scene. Put yourself in another place where it's bright and beautiful. Maybe there's a field of grass and you see the beauty of the grass and it's kind of a place where you just want to lay down and so you lay down and you, you also see some of the other beauty around you, the trees. You see a road that's gold and, and, and walls that are made of these precious stones and gates of pearls. In the background you hear laughter of, of children and, and adults fellowshipping together. You hear shouts of praise and hallelujahs. You feel a complete peace and tranquility. You get up from that field and you start walking down the path and it takes you a road towards a throne in the middle of the city. And there you see God sitting on his throne. And you're just in this place of compel. I just got to worship God because of 
this wonderfulness to know that I, have, I can be in this place for eternity and I can talk to God face to face and not be afraid of death or, or, or be ashamed of sin anymore because my sins have been washed away. All the worries of your life has gone away and those are no longer concerns. You feel complete peace and joy. That's a picture of heaven. Again, I don't know about you, but I know I want to go to heaven. I'm pretty sure that I can see look at each of you. I'm sure all of you want to go to heaven. Again, that's why Jesus died on the cross. To give us the invitation to have an eternity with him in heaven. So here's the one thing we must do, a challenge for us all, is to surrender our life to Jesus. You may have made that decision some time ago, or maybe a short time ago, where you confess your faith and place confess your sin and place your faith in Jesus and said, I surrender my life to you. Great, you are a brother and sister in Christ. Your your eternity is reserved in heaven. But may we be reminded as Christians to continue to surrender our lives to him in all things. And for those who are listening who may not be a Christian yet. What's holding you back from receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior? I dare say that there's nothing that important that should hold you back from receiving his gift. Because it is a matter of your destiny for eternity. Heaven or hell. God has given us the choice. But here's the encouragement. If you are a Christian, you are assured of your salvation You don't have to worry about losing your salvation because you can't. Yes, it's true that some people can walk away from their faith and give up their salvation, but there's no one in this world, not even Satan or the demonic, can cause you to lose your salvation. So you have the assurance of your salvation. If you remain faithful in Him and continue to grow in your relationship with Him, you will not lose your salvation. That is a guarantee that God gives you. That you don't have to go to the bank to take because you can take that to heaven. Do you want to escape hell and have an eternity in heaven? Then place your faith in Him. Trust in Him. Living for Him. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this doctrine of heaven and hell. Lord, we love hearing about heaven and how beautiful and wonderful it is, but often we don't like hearing the side of, of hell. But Lord, we know that you designed it to be a place of punishment for, for if we don't confess our sins, if we don't humble ourselves to you. Lord, as Christians, as we have heard this message this morning, you may have stirred in our hearts our minds people who are lost yet who do not yet know you. Lord, may part of our action in this this morning be ready and willing to go to them and say, hey, here's the good news. There's some bad news in this. If you don't receive God's gift, you won't have eternity in heaven. You'll have an eternity in hell. Lord, again, may the message of hell be, be motivation for us to reach out to those who are lost, even those who are our, our enemies. But also, may heaven be also a motivator because of how beautiful and wonderful it is that we would want to see everyone there friend or foe Lord Jesus we thank you so much for your love and your grace that you provide a way for us to escape an eternity of hell and have an eternity with you in heaven truly God you are a good God Amen